Kirchhoff's law states that the total electrical current flowing into any junction in the circuit must be equal to the total current leaving, that is, the current through the junction must be conserved. The law follows from the conservation of charge, which says that the total charge inside any closed system must remain constant. In an electrical circuit, charge is carried by electrons, and so the conservation of charge is equivalent to the statement that the number of electrons entering a junction must be equal to the number of electrons leaving. Over the last several decades, developments in nanotechnology have motivated the study of electron flow through nanoscale devices. As the size of electronic components becomes smaller, the effects of quantum mechanics become more pronounced, and so the classical description of electron flow becomes inadequate. Electrons are quantum mechanical particles with wave-like behavior described by their wave function. And so the classical notion of a current of discrete particles is no longer useful. Quantum mechanics must be used as the foundation to construct an analog for Kirchhoff's law in quantum wires. In 1995, Robert Kostrykin and Vadim Schrader published a paper formulating exactly this quantum mechanical equivalent. Their analogous law employs the concept of a probability current and uses mathematical analysis to show that a conservation law exists for the probability current in a network of quantum wires. The probability current is defined as j is equal to h bar over 2mi times by a big bracket, the conjugate of the wave function psi star, gradient of psi minus the reverse of that term. Or in one dimension, this would look like same prefactor, psi star times derivative of psi with respect to position x, and again, minus the reverse. And here, we're writing this only for single particle wave function psi. According to the Kirchhoff rule for quantum wires, the probability current as defined by this equation must be conserved through any junction in a network of wires. The simplest condition that satisfies this requirement is that the wave function must be continuous at the junction and the derivatives of the wave function around the junction must sum up to zero. To see this, suppose we have n wires meeting at a junction like this. Maybe there could be a few more wires in there. And let psi 1 to psi n be the wave function components defined on each of these wires surrounding the junction then the boundary conditions, as I've just described, would say that psi 1 at 0, if we orient all of the axes of these wires so that 0 is at the junction, should be equal to the wave function on any selected wire of index i, all the way up to psi n, and the sum of these wave functions derivatives at zero must be zero. And by inserting this into our expression for probability current, which was j equals h bar over 2mi, this time multiplied by the sum from i equals 1 to n of psi star i at zero, because we want to know the probability current through the junction, multiplied by the derivative of psi i at zero, minus psi i at zero, derivative of psi star at zero. And then insert these conditions in, we find that we can pull out the wave function and the conjugate of the wave function. by setting all of them equal to the wave function's value on wire one. And we get left with this sum of derivatives exactly as described in my boundary conditions. And so using this, we can set this probability current through the junction to zero which is exactly the Kirchhoff condition, as I described. Kostrykin and Schrader formulated their proof of this law from the axioms of quantum mechanics using the theory of self-adjoint operators. In quantum mechanics, 
the Schrodinger equation is solved to find the real values energies that the system will take. The wave functions psi are the eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian operator, and the energies are the eigenvalues. In order for the energies to be real, so they will correspond to a real observable, the expected value of the Hamiltonian operator must be real, which means that this inner product must be equal to its conjugate which means that the inner product with the adjoint of H must be equal to the inner product with H itself. So in order for the energies that the system takes to be real, the Hamiltonian H must be self-adjoint. Now, in the case of a free particle, the Hamiltonian is simply proportional to minus the Laplacian. So we must find boundary conditions that make the Laplacian self-adjoint on the domain that we are studying in our quantum wires. In mathematics, operators are characterized by their behavior on some domain in a Hilbert space. So for an operator A, we define its domain, D of A, to be the set of vectors V in H, for which the action of the operator A on V is also in H. Now, before we can define the adjoint of A, which involves defining its domain, we need to make use of a theorem called the Rice representation theorem. The Rice representation theorem says that for any continuous linear function, functional phi, so a functional being something that maps from the Hilbert space, from this vector space, to some field, such as the complex numbers, there exists a unique f in the Hilbert space, a vector, known as the Rice representation of f, for which phi of x is equal to the inner product of f with x. The adjoint of a, denoted a dagger, is defined to be the operator with the domain d of a dagger corresponding to all vectors y in h for which there exists a z in h which satisfies the following. Y A X is equal to Z X. And we set adjoint of A Y equal to Z. So the action of A dagger will be to map Y to Z according to this definition. And we can see how this definition is related to the Rice representation theorem simply by setting some functional phi of x equal to this inner product. And then the conditions in the Rice representation will define the existence of this vector z, which is the image of y under this adjoint map. Now, when will we be able to choose some y in h such that there isn't a z in h which satisfies this? Well, if you remember the conditions in the Rice representation theorem, this functional has to be continuous. And so if we choose a y for which this inner product is not continuous with, with respect to x, then we do not know that there will exist a Rice representation z that we can use to define this adjoint map. In fact, in general, the domain of the adjoint may be much larger than the domain of the original operator. This is obvious to see if we know that the operator A is symmetric, which means that we can apply A to either vector in this product, in which case the existence of a Z satisfying the domain of this adjoint is clear from the symmetry uh, of this operator. So in this case, Z being in the domain of A, or let's say x in the domain of A, would imply that x is in the domain of A adjoint. But this implication may not work the other way around. So in general, we will have d of A is some subset of the domain of A adjoint. An operator A is called self-adjoint if 
a is equal to a dagger, which means that the domain of a must be equal to the domain of its adjoint, and the action of a on any vector in the Hilbert space must be equal to the action of a dagger when x is in the domain of a and its own adjoint. Now, given that we had d of a may be smaller than d of a dagger, there is often a way of defining a self-adjoint operator from a symmetric operator by extending the domain of the operator a until it's large enough that we have this equivalence between the domain of a and its adjoint. Now, this is where the relevance of the boundary conditions of the wave functions comes into play. In order to define a self-adjoint Hamiltonian, which means finding some self-adjoint extension of the Laplacian, we have to consider the boundary conditions which characterize these domains, d of a and d of a are joint. Kostrikin and Schrader show, as an example, that the domain of wave functions d of h, which for free particles will be domain of minus the Laplacian, is not large enough to characterize a self-adjoint Hamiltonian if we only consider wave functions where the value of the wave functions goes to zero at junctions in the network. And what Kostrikin and Schrader were able to show as the main result of their paper is that the domain of functions, which gives boundary conditions on these wave functions, for which the Hamiltonian is self-adjoint on the network of wires, is exactly the set of functions that obey that Kirchhoff-type condition that I described earlier. This theory has been developed further by mathematicians, including Bolter and Kerner, to study systems of many quantum particles on a network of wires. In this case, the domain on which the wave functions must be defined is not the network itself, but instead the configuration space of n particles on the network of wires. For a network, which we will denote gamma, the configuration space of n particles on gamma, Cn gamma, is equal to gamma to the power of n, so that's the product over n copies of gamma, minus the diagonal delta n, quotiented by the symmetric group Sn. Now what this does is, by removing the set delta n, the diagonal, we remove any configurations in which, say, particle i and a particle with label j are actually in the same configuration. And by quotienting by the symmetric group, we identify any configurations, say, xi and xj, where the coordinates are the same, but with the positions, i.e. the labeling of these particles, reversed. The configuration space of n particles on the network consists of small regions describing each of the particles on individual wires in the network, and these regions are then glued together along their boundaries. For example, if we had three particles on a network of three wires, then the configuration space would consist of domains such as D11, so these are small regions within the configuration space, where each of the three particles is on wire one, or rather, a, a, the wire that we've labeled one in this network, one, two, three of three wires. It would also consist of regions such as D123, some small region inside the configuration space in which particle or one of the particles is on wire one, one of the particles is on wire two, and one of the wires is on uh, one of the particles is on wire three. And there wouldn't be regions like D312, because this is identified by the action of the symmetric group with all of the configurations that are already in D123. The condition on the wave functions at the gluing points of these small regions then is precisely a Kirchhoff type condition as I described earlier. So at the gluing points between these two different regions, you're moving through a configuration in which a particle moves from one wire to another. And so along those boundaries of the regions in the configuration space, we have to apply a Kirchhoff type condition 
to uh, account for the fact that a particle is moving through the junction from one wire onto another. We can see more clearly why this is by considering the configuration space of three particles, of two particles on a network of three wires in this Y graph, as it's known by mathematicians. So we're looking at C2, this Y. And we can label each of the endpoints of any wire as one, two, three, four. Now the configuration space must consist of some configurations in which one particle is at the end of a wire and the other particle is at a different end of a wire. So we can construct this hexagon as a sort of foundation for the configuration space and identify the corners of the hexagon with the different configurations in which one particle is at one end of a wire and the other particle is at an end of another wire. So for example, if we start at a configuration such as one, two, then we could move through configurations corresponding to moving a particle from two to three to arrive at one, three, and then move the particle that was at one to two to arrive at two, three, and then once we're at two, three, move the particle at two to four, taking us to four, three, then move the particle at three back into two, to four, two, and then moving the particle at two back to one to get to four, one, or one, four. Uh, and we usually write these uh, configurations in such a way that the lowest number always comes first due to this action of the symmetric group. So I can write that as two, four, and this configuration as three, four. And then we can only get to configurations in which uh, both of the particles are at the end of the same wire from certain configurations. So when we're in one, two, we can move the particle at two back down to one to get to one, one. And from 2, 3, we can move to 3, 3. And from 2, 4, we can move to 4, 4. And it's along these lines, which are the three lines corresponding to one of the particles moving through this junction, position 2, that we will have to apply the Kirchhoff condition. And then the diagonal are these other lines joining the configurations with two particles at an endpoint back into the center, where both of the particles are at the junction 2, 2. Now, how do we apply these Kirchhoff conditions? Well, the mathematics tells us that the way that we apply these Kirchhoff conditions is by summing up the normal derivatives. So these are the derivatives along perpendicular directions to the boundary. And if you take the sum of those normal derivatives at a particular point on this boundary, then the Kirchhoff type rule says that they should add up to zero. And this sort of makes sense physically because that corresponds to moving through configurations in which one of the particles is moving through the junction. So there is some physical basis for this description. And this means that we can extend this Kirchhoff rule for quantum wires to many particle quantum systems. Finally, we should be able to see that the familiar Kirchhoff rule for electric current can be explained from the quantum mechanical equivalent. And for this discussion, I'm only going to consider single particle wave functions for simplicity, although the argument can be carried up to greater number of particles. Let xj be any point corresponding to a junction in the network of wires. Then our Kirchhoff type rule says that for different wave functions on different wires, which we'll label I, then the wave functions from two different component wires must be the same at the junction, and that this condition on the sum of the derivatives from different wires 
and here we're going to use vector derivatives and take the normal direction at the junction. These should add up to zero according to our Kirchhoff rule. In order to derive a Kirchhoff rule for current, we need to define the charge density. The charge density, which I can call rho, can be equal to E, which is the charge of this particle that we're considering, multiplied by the probability density function that you get from the wave function. Or you could alternatively write this as the inner product of psi, psi times E. The expected value of the current should then be the time derivative of this expression. So this is E times by the time derivative of this product. And we can apply the product rule in order to derive this. We should find this equal to E times d by dt of the bra of psi times psi, which in this case is the conjugate of the wave function plus bra psi times by the derivative of the ket of the wave function. Now, from the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, which is the time derivative of psi equal to 1 over ih bar times the Hamiltonian acting on psi, this implies by taking the dual that we can work out the following expression for the time derivative of the bra of psi. And here we take bra of psi acted on by the adjoint of A. This means that we can write our expression for the current that we had before, which involved this time derivative, as E over IH bar times psi H dagger psi minus psi H. And if psi is a wave function on a domain on which uh, the Hamiltonian is self-joint, i.e. if it's a wave function obeying this Kirchhoff condition that we said Kostrykin and Schrader have been able to prove made the Hamiltonian self-joint on the graph, then in that case, this is zero. It should say that the expected value of the net current through the entire circuit is zero. Or you could restrict to, say, just a subcomponent of the circuit where you have n wires, maybe three wires, meeting at a junction, then this rule should still hold, given this Kirchhoff rule that Kostrykin and Schrader derived. And then we can see more clearly what's happening through some junction in the wires by expanding out this expression for a free particle Hamiltonian, in which case we will have that i is equal to e over i h bar multiplied by h bar squared over 2m and then multiplied by this expression that we had before. So this is psi rad squared psi or Laplacian psi minus that's where it's psi. And obviously, because we're going to set everything to zero, it doesn't matter which way around we write these as long as there's still the minus sign there. And then we can cancel the h bars. And you get left with the following expression that the charge through the circuit at this point xj, xj is equal to E h bar over 2 i m times the divergence at x j or around x j of the following expression. Psi grad psi minus grad psi times psi, which is exactly the Dirac quantum mechanical probability current j that we discussed earlier. And we said that this probability current must go to zero 
at the junction and we can see exactly that through the reasoning that we've made here regarding the self-joint uh, Laplacian on the graph. So this is another way of seeing this uh, fact about the Kirchhoff rule allowing for a self-joint Hamiltonian and also it shows that the classical electric current Kirchhoff rule can be described or uh, derived from this quantum mechanical rule. Now that's all that we're going to have time for today. I hope that you've enjoyed this explanation of this interesting fact in quantum mechanics and how it relates to the classical electric circuit rules that you'll be used to. So thanks again for watching. I'll see you soon.